Would you open your copy of God's infallible word to the book of Psalms, chapter 1, or Psalm 1, and we're going to share together from God's word a message that I believe God has given to me to give to you. And I sense the presence of God, the Holy Spirit here today, that more so than other days. And so some heart is going to be saved, some heart is going to be enriched by being together in God's house. Amen? Amen. When I prepare for Bible messages, I take them very seriously, and I study God's Word very carefully. And I believe that all of God's Word is infallible. There are no mistakes in it. This is not the opinion of man. If it were the opinion of a writer, then I have the freedom to accept or reject, to abide or to ignore that opinion. Otherwise, I could easily say, well, that's your opinion. But if I believe that this is what God has said, through writers, then I need to address it. So when I study God's Word, it is to prepare for the preaching and the teaching of God's Word. I also study God's Word so that when I, people come to me for counsel or just for encouragement, it isn't just based on my opinion but based on the authority of God's Word. But then there are times that I read God's Word for no one's benefit but mine. And when I do that, I read the Scriptures as if God has not written His Word to anyone else other than to me. And I don't do that from an egomaniac point of view where I'm the only chosen one to receive his written word. But I do that so that when I read God's word for me, I can't ignore it. I can't get around it. I can't dance around it. I can't explain it. I can't say, well, this is for that person. It's for me. So I'm going to read Psalm 1 the way I read it for me. And you read along with me Psalm 1 for you. How blessed is Dave Meldrum who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But Dave Meldrum delights in the law of the Lord and in God's law, Dave Meldrum meditates day and night. Dave Meldrum will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever Dave Meldrum does, Dave Meldrum prospers. The wicked are not so. But they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. May God add his blessing upon this the reading of his holy word. May we pray together. Heavenly Father, we've read your word in your presence. You know every mind, every heart that sits in your presence or watching by television. And you know how to save those who are lost so that they will become found by your grace and mercy and salvation in Jesus Christ by, by faith alone. You know, Heavenly Father, how to uplift sanging hearts 
stir complacent minds so that we rise up changed in your presence here today. So we commend ourselves to your presence, to the power of the Holy Spirit, to persuade us, to change us, to motivate us, however you see fit to do. And we'll be careful to give you the praise that you alone so richly deserve. In the loving name of Jesus Christ, that name which is above every other name, we ask this prayer together by faith. And all believers joined and said together, Amen. In that marvelous document called the Declaration of Independence, we are told that Americans, every American has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, I'm not sure exactly what our forefathers had in mind when they used those words, pursuit of happiness. But I know there are many people seeking happiness today. You are among them. I am among them. God says to me in Psalm 1, my son David, here is where you will find your happiness, and here is where you will not find happiness in your life. And God says, come to this pulpit and tell the people in the congregation and tell those watching by television, this is where you will find your happiness. And this is where you will not find your happiness. And the kind of happiness that God is talking about here is not the ha-ha kind of happiness. That's pleasure. This is not the kind of happiness that brings a smile to our face if we hear a, a funny joke. That's enjoyment. No, this is not the kind of happiness that comes when you get a pay raise. That's satisfying. This is the kind of happiness that you have within your heart when your heart is broken, when your mind is confused, when your eyes are filled with tears. And you don't know which way to turn. God says, but, oh, happy day. A pastor by the name of George McCloyd from Scotland years ago came to this country for the first time. And he was here over New Year's Day time, and he never saw an American football game. And he heard about these games, and so they said, you can turn on the television and almost any channel, you'll see an American football game. And so he did. And after watching that game, he wrote this. I turned on the TV to watch a parade in America, but instead I saw a picture like I had never seen before. I saw men in a group in a circle, bent over, and talking about something. On the other side of this line was another group of men who seemed to be yelling at each other. And in a few seconds, a circle of men broke up and ran up to the ball. One man promptly gave it to another man who promptly gave it to another man as he ran past him. Then everyone jumped on the man with the ball and gave him an awful beating. <laughs> Those men obviously felt bad because they got together in a circle to pray about it. <laughs> they obviously weren't sincere because they did it again to the guy with the ball. After repeating this whole outrageous procedure, the man with the ball suddenly threw it at a great distance to another man who caught it and ran it to a specially marked area, and he did a funny little dance, and the crowd went wild. Well, then the pastor went on and used that as an illustration of people pursuing the wrong things, 
pursuing the wrong ball. They were faked out. And that people are going through life pursuing the wrong things. The point of Psalm 1 is to tell us this. If you're pursuing happiness in the wrong places, you'll never find it. But if you're pursuing happiness in the right places, you will find it. And then it will be an oh happy day. So let's look first of all where you will not find happiness. In verse 1. No one will ever find happiness in the counsel of the wicked. The Bible calls those who are, do not accept Jesus Christ as Savior as wicked. Now they may not think of themselves as being wicked. They in fact in the eyes of others may not be wicked. But God says if you reject my son as your personal Savior in my eyes. As much as I love you you are still wicked. And when the unsaved give counsel or advice or guidance, and we listen to it, then we're pursuing happiness in the wrong place. Because their advice is not of God. Their guidance is not of God. Satan is a liar. Satan has never told the truth. He lies to us all the time. He lied to Adam and Eve. He lies to us today. And he says, if you will just but do this, you'll be happy. And if we buy into it, we're following the counsel of the wicked. You'll never find happiness in verse 1 in the path of sinners. Those that are trying to find happiness by sinning against God are like those that are in a first-class ticket seat on the wrong plane. Might be enjoyable, but it doesn't last. Howard Hughes, a man that's known by, the name is known by us, always talked about wanting more. Howard Hughes Spent his entire life wanting more money, so he worked to become the wealthiest man in the world. He wanted more fame, so he broke, the, broke into the Hollywood scene as a filmmaker and star. He wanted more sensual pleasures, so he paid huge amounts of money to indulge in every immoral urge. He wanted more thrills, so he designed and built and piloted the fastest airplane in the world. He wanted more power. So he secretly dealt political favors so skillfully that two United States presidents became his pawns. All he ever wanted was more. He was absolutely convinced that more would bring him true happiness. Unfortunately, history shows otherwise. This man who wanted more and got it all concluded his life emaciated with a sunken chest, fingernails and grotesque inches long corkscrews, rotted teeth, and innumerable needle marks from his drug addiction. Howard Hughes died believing the myth that the more this world alone he had, the more happier he would be, and he died as an insane billionaire. That's the path of sinners. And us believers have got to be careful that we're not caught up in this. Because we all need money. You don't. I know, because you're the wealthy ones. But we all know what that is like. We all know the finances of stress of finances. We all know the lack of things that we would want and certainly like. We all have issues that we're not that don't make us happy and, and and so if we could just just get over here and if we could just do this then we'd be happy and that's the path of sinners verse one you'll never find happiness in the seat of scoffers we're surrounded by scoffers 
people who no longer believe in God's word. They scoff at it. They scoff at prayer. They scoff at us. Weirdos that go to church. We're weak. We need God. They scoff at everything that we believe in. Notice in verse 1, the progression. Walking, standing, sitting. Walking in the Bible is, describes our lifestyle. Walking, our lifestyle in the counsel of the wicked will never lead to happiness. Standing, position of security. I'm standing, I'm secure. Is what the Bible calls the way of relationship with God. And in path of sinners is, we're not standing, standing in the path of sinners is not secure. And then sitting, sitting is when you rest and you relax. After a hard day, you just like to sit and relax. It's all I wanted to do to an choir member number, just sit over there and relax. But no, I had to stand <laughs> and be off beat. I just made that up. And <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying here. Sitting is a place to relax. And, and, and unfortunately, there are so many people that just want to sit and relax and enjoy the journey for themselves. So we'll never find happiness in the way of the world. There's a pastor friend of mine, long since retired, Craig Larson. Uh, he retired and lives in Clayton, and, um, which is south of here, down near Vineland. And there's folks here from Vineland and Franklin, but we don't say their names at all because that wouldn't be right to say that Zimmermans are here and Hughes's are here uh, from those faraway places. And that is an overnight trip for the likes of me. It's so far away. But anyway, I digress. But at any rate, he, bought, uh, he and his wife bought this uh, lovely home on Wilson Lake in Clayton. And it had a detached garage. It has a detached garage. And, and he bought it. He was going to put a wood shop into it. He likes to fool around with wood machines and, or machines with wood and so forth. And uh, when he opened up the garage, it was infested with mice. So he ran to Home Depot and bought a bunch of the, uh, the decon boxes. And he said it was amazing to watch the mice go crazy over the decon that was so tasty. <laughs> that was my imitation of a mouse. If, if, if you thought I was having some kind of something wrong, I was. <laughs> but at any rate. But his point to me some time ago was, that's the way he sees people. They're just going crazy. They're in a frenzy. And it's poison, what they're after. So where is happiness found? In verse 2. We look at the first word in verse 2 of Psalm 1, but. What a powerful word that is. That's a shift. But. See, we got the bad news, but here's the good news. On a hot, summer, blistering, humid day, you're outside, outside and you're really, really yuck. And then, but, you come in the air conditioning. There's a shift. Or on a cold winter's day and you're freezing outside and you come inside where it's warm, but you feel better. There's a shift. So we've got a shift going on here. But here's where you will find happiness. And it's found on meditating in God's word. Chewing on it. We're in the baseball season. Can you imagine playing baseball when there are no rules? No umpires. Just go out and play. Whatever. 
just play. I've already run the bases a thousand times. Just keep playing. Who cares? No, you have to have rules. You have to have umpires. God's word is his umpire, is our umpire. And God says, here is where you will find happiness. It's all right here. We just have to obey it. Pastor Craig Larson, or Peg, uh, Craig, uh, excuse me, it's Pastor Edwin Lutzen. He's now since retired, but he's written several books as well. And in his book, Putting Your Past Behind You, he tells about a wealthy attorney that he was friendly with who had several, 17 clients who owed him a, thousands and thousands of dollars and this attorney felt led by the Lord to forgive the debt of these clients. Thousands and thousands of dollars. So he sent each of the clients who owed him money a certified letter explaining that he was a Christian, explaining that he was canceling their debt. And all 17 letters were returned unaccepted and unopened. He couldn't understand it. And so he thought, well, maybe I have the wrong addresses, but that wasn't true. So he finally got to the bottom of it. All 17 were afraid to open it, that they were being sued by the attorney for the debt that he owed them. And all he was trying to do was to forgive their debt. But they didn't know it because they didn't open the letter. This is God's letter. And he says, if you will but open it and meditate upon it, you will discover that I have forgiven you. And therein is, med- is, is happiness. So, in Psalm 1, a person who seeks God's will. Look at the Bolton cover. Would you just, you know, humor me. Just look at the bulletin cover. Jeanette Coughlin, our church secretary, creates all of our bulletin covers. And that's the neatest bulletin cover for, for today's message. This is it. Taking your will. God, this is what I have going on in my home right now. God, this is what I've got going on in my body right now. God, this is what I've got going on in my neighborhood right now. God, this is what's going on in my mind right now. And God, what I want is to take my will and match it with your will. Because when my will matches your will, then I am happy. Until then... I'm unhappy. Why? Because I'm off trying to do my will. And God's saying, I'm over here. I'm over here. Come on back over here. And when we say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, then our wills match with God. When we're like that, we are like, in verse 3 of Psalm 1, a tree planted by the living waters. I love trees. The bigger the tree, the deeper the roots. God says you're like a tree. In verse 3, you're a godly person that produces fruit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5. Kindness, gentleness, sweetness, lovingness, peacefulness. And God says there's no law that can make you do that. You do it by desire, but you produce fruit, and therein is happiness. Verse 3, you don't wither. You don't wither. I know we're in the season of where everything's growing, but uh, you'll hear me say this in the fall. I say it so often, but I just love to say it. I hate raking leaves. (laughs) Raking leaves is the dumbest thing that God has ever given man opportunity to do. It's a waste of time. 
because you spend 17 hours waking the, raking the lawn, and when you get it all to the curb, you turn around and they're all back again. <laughs> so my theory is God created the trees, God created the leaves, God caused the leaves to fall. If he wants the leaves off the lawn, he can blow them off. They can stay there as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Karen, however, doesn't feel that way. So that's why several Christmases ago, I bought her a leaf blower. I thought that was very nice of me to do. Very generous of me. But anyway, isn't it great to know that we won't wither? We don't wither. We're God's evergreens by his grace. We won't wither. You are here today proving to yourself you don't wither by God's grace. Because you've all been through something, or you're going through something, and you're still here. Why? Because God says, you're seeking my will, you won't wither. And therein is happiness. And in verse 3, you prosper. Boy, do I need to qualify that in a hurry. Because we are seeing all around us an absolute lie of Satan. That if you give money, you'll get money. How many have heard the prosperity gospel? Oh, some of you aren't telling the truth then. <laughs> And folks, that is not of God. Not of God. The prospering that God talks about in the scriptures has nothing, 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 nothing. Nothing. With money. It has to do with prospering in the spirit of the Holy Spirit. And growing in the Holy Spirit. You'll prosper. In the Holy Spirit. That money can't buy. And then God gives a warning. Verses 4 to 6. What pathetic words they are in my view. We're just hearing. Boy. When you delight in the Lord, you're, you're a tree family, firmly planted. You're producing fruit. You're not withering. You're prospering. But the wicked, not so. I would dare say all of you know someone that's totally unchurched, unsaved. They almost brag about it. In fact, they do brag about it. And they've got everything. And you're saying to yourself, what's up with that? The wicked not so. They're like the chafe, just blown away. So which are we going to be like? Where are we going to seek our happiness? God gives us a choice. Now, my dear friend, you came here this morning for a reason. But it might not be what you think is the reason. God brought you here. God is the one that got you out of bed today. Some of you might be here and you say, I didn't want to come today. I'm only here because of this picnic they got going on out there. And I thought that was cool. I really didn't feel like coming in here. No, no. This is where you belong, because God is dealing with you. God's dealing with me. God's dealing with each of us. We have a choice. Are we going to be happy God's way, or are we going to be unhappy God, according to God's way? And therefore, pleasing Satan and displeasing God. God has said it. I believe it. And that settles it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for the enjoyment we have in the spirit of knowing Jesus Christ as our Savior. But now, Father, we pray for the ones sitting next to us, in front of us, behind us, 
who may not know Jesus Christ as his or her Savior. We pray for those watching by television who may not know Jesus Christ as Savior. Father God, your desire is for them to repent and to become saved by faith. We pray for their salvation here or elsewhere. And we pray for our fellow believers. We pray for ourselves who are so discouraged, so troubled, so upset about many things. But you have shown us clearly, Father, the way of your happiness. May we have that great desire to pursue it as you desire for us to do. Change hearts, convict hearts, and we'll be careful to give you the praise the honor, the glory that you alone so deserve. We offer this prayer by faith. And as we sing our final hymn together, if it's your desire to come forward for any reason, the cameras will not be on you. I'm not going to embarrass you for any reason. But if you desire to come forward, I'll be glad to meet with you in the front of the sanctuary. Father God, now as we worship you in song, May the Holy Spirit give us a holy moment in a life-changing way. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray together. And all believers joined and said together, Amen. Let's stand and sing unto the Lord. The wonder of it all. It's your desire to come forward. You're welcome to do so. As we stand and sing together, number 64. Let's stand and sing together, please. Father, I sense that decisions have been made within hearts here today. And we know that you're going to honor those decisions and empower them to be fulfilled by your Holy Spirit. As we leave this place of worship today, Father God, may we leave changed in a way that we never thought we would be when we came into this place of worship Touch us afresh with your peace. Touch us afresh with your joy. Touch us afresh with your happiness. And may we leave this place rejoicing in the truth 
that because Jesus Christ is alive, the best is yet to come. Amen and amen. Thank you.